Okay, uh, we have uh, one last session, and uh, I'm happy to say that we've gained so much time. We're like definitely going to be on time for dinner so we can be relaxed. Um, we have uh, one last session, and should be a very interesting session. And because I've rushed us through the other sessions, let me just say that when we get to the discussion period, please feel free to come back to any aspect of what we've discussed uh, this morning and this afternoon. Um, but this afternoon session uh, is going to look a little bit at uh, the more geopolitical aspects of the technical questions that we've been discussing. And uh, we're going to start with uh, Dr. Kohai Hashimoto, uh, who is the uh, president for the Institute of New Intela International Political Systems. Uh, we're very happy that he had time to participate in this study because he's a academic in great demand, not only uh, in Japan, but in for a lot of other international think tanks. So, uh, Kohai. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's uh, nearly 6 o'clock in the morning in Japan, and uh, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> <laughs> I got to have a lot of energy to talk about the energy issue from now. And um, uh, Ms. Uh, Sugi no, uh, is going to supplement my talk. Uh, right after my uh, presentation. So uh, she's going to talk about China and Russia relationship. So um, I'm going to talk about something else. Right, uh, and at the same time, I try to be short. Uh, this morning, uh, we talked about uh, economic aspect of the uh, oil issue. And uh, uh, part of our afternoon session, we talked about um, Russian domestic uh, system in uh, kind of a political uh, economy uh, of uh, current Russia. And uh, in se section three, we talked about pipeline route and international politics. So uh, we have a clear cut definition of uh, our market on one, on one hand and the politics on the other. So uh, I would like to uh, reorient our mind into this simple dichotomy uh, of market versus politics. And the interesting thing is. Um, Listening to all the presentations, um, we all agree that Russia and China tend to see oil and gas issue from the viewpoint of international politics. And whereas the United States tend to see oil and gas issues from the market point of view. And uh, speaking of Japan, Japanese viewpoint is moving closer to less fair policy, especially for gas issue. So we have to have a um, simple dichotomy, an image, uh, in a way that um, uh, how we uh, talk about um, energy uh, issue from the viewpoint of uh, um, market and the viewpoint from politics. Uh, at the same time, we have to talk, um, we have to recapitulate our mind uh, from the viewpoint uh, of a supplier versus consumer uh, point of view. So we want to talk about um, that. Uh, and in the first half of my presentation is going to talk about uh, from the viewpoint of the supply side. Uh, it looks like this. Now, um, from the supply side, we're talking uh, uh, in this conference um, is uh, how to deal with Russian oil and gas. And um, from the point of view of uh, Russia, uh, there are several uh, cards to play. Uh, namely, uh, United States card, EU card, China card, Japan card, and other options. So uh, we are going to talk, um, take a brief look at um, each of these. Uh, this could be a repetition, but um, uh, interesting um, to uh, uh, look over. Um, from the viewpoint of the United States, uh, from uh, Russia to the United States, uh, West Siberia to Murmansk route to east coast of the United States um, is considered to be uh, one card from the viewpoint of Russia. Uh, nevertheless, heavy use of Murmansk route would reduce possible eastward supply of West Siberian oil uh, that will reduce supply to China or Japan. And third, supply of Russian oil would reduce dependency on the Middle East uh, from the viewpoint of the United States and especially the west coast of the United States will be benefited from that. And finally, Russian oil could supplement Alaska mm -hmm. oil. So uh, uh, from the viewpoint of the United States, um, this is a very uh, uh, tasty commercial uh, 
uh, card. Now, take a look at the China, uh, from Siberia to China. Uh, East Siberia oil is exported to China by docking, by pipeline. Uh, in this case, economically, this is the best solution, as uh, Mr. Zhu has pointed out. Uh, and the reduction of Chinese dependency over the Middle Eastern oil uh, is a very good thing uh, relating to our, our Asian energy security as well. But nevertheless, China will be the sole consumer of the East Siberian oil. And what does, it, what does this imply politically to Russia and vice versa? So uh, uh, here uh, we have a uh, um, very interesting uh, political viewpoint uh, from the viewpoint of China and as well as from the viewpoint of Russia. Um, if Russia is going to supply uh, from East Siberian oil uh, solely to uh, China, um, and China being a sole uh, consumer of uh, East Siberian oil, um, means a lot politically uh, to the both countries. So uh, I would not elaborate on this point because uh, Mr. Sino you know, is going to, uh, Ms. You know, is going to talk about that later. Uh, but this is um, a point of interest to remember. And the final point is Japanese high dependency on the Middle East, Middle East and oil will continue. Um, this is um, Chinese card. Now, I talk about Japanese card. Uh, from Siberia to Japan, <coughs> uh, East Siber Siberian oil is exported to Nahutuka by pipeline and distributed from that. And this contributes to the energy security of Japan for sure. And second, contributes to the reduction of the Asian premium, perhaps. And third, paves the way for exportation of multiple directions, importantly South Korea, Taiwan, and the west coast of the United States, as well as China. So our, um, Mr. Zhu had just pointed out, you know, our, if you are uh, draw a pipeline to Naotoka, Japan is going to be the sole um, recipient of uh, uh, East Siberia. No, that's not true. Uh, we have um, uh, anticipated um, multiple buyers and consumers, uh, whereas uh, if pipeline goes to uh, Daking, uh, to China, China is going to be the sole recipient, for sure. And the fourth, increased Chinese dependency on the Middle East oil, and this is a negative point uh, if, we, if we consider the energy security of the whole uh, region. And the final point is for the U.S., this is the second uh, best option besides Murmansk route because um, uh, oil is available uh, by shipment from Nautoka. Now, well, having said that, um, everybody questions, um, and we don't know it yet, um, how much oil is coming from East Siberia as well as, well as West Siberia. Um, as far as we know, um, it seems to us that uh, uh, Siberia oil doesn't have enough uh, quantity to provide both China to China and Japan, as well as to the United States. So we have to have choices. And this is a focal point of uh, uh, Russian diplomacy to come in. So. Um, uh, current level of estimated production in Siberia is not enough to satisfy both Chinese and Japanese as well as United States uh, need. And could, in the, uh, uh, could investment into the East Siberian oil field lead to expansion of the production level? And um, probably Japanese investment and soft loan for both development of oil field in East Siberia could help expand uh, quantity uh, from Siberia to multiple directions and satisfy all of them. So um, this is a point uh, to excavate and um, uh, think about from the viewpoint of uh, uh, supplier, that namely Russia. But um, when we talk about um, energy issue, we have to have another player that is a consumer. If we don't uh, take consumer into account, uh, we are easily misled into um, political uh, uh, jungle uh, where 
supplier is free, has a free hand of uh, quote unquote divide and rule. And this is a, um, not my term, but um, Mr. Naito's term that I like it, so I use it. Uh, divide and rule uh, policy of Russia uh, is prevailing now uh, because uh, Russia has a uh, multiple counterplay. And this is uh, our reality uh, we are facing now. Now, when we think about uh, consumer side, what <clears throat> is going to happen? Um, first, I said divide and rule policy of Russia. Uh, today, Russia is using Japan counterplay with China for its pipeline policy. And Russia is using its energy relation with the EU as a count to deal with the United States and Asian consumers. Versus uh, what are we con going to th uh, think about, uh, we have to think about, uh, is a um, uh, strategy of consumers. The Asian market could have a meaningful bargaining power against the supply side, this is for sure. Second, formation of the Asian version of IEA is worth considering. And third, Japan-China cooperation to this end is highly recommended. And finally, issues such as which way the Siberian pipeline is connected or how to deal with oil and gas in Sakhalin should be dealt with uh, within this framework. So multiple cooperation among consumers is uh, highly recommended uh, to have a bargaining power to the supplier. Besides, uh, we talked a lot about um, this in the morning and the part of the afternoon session uh, about how uh, OPEC and no OPEC uh, uh, relation is going to be in the future. Um, the first point is, is Saudi Arabia our, our enemy? <laughs> this is a shocking presentation, but um, it's not um, our, our kind of unimaginable thing. Um, 20 years ago, who thought Iraq is going to be the enemy of the United States and uh, who uh, would, would anticipate the uh, Iraqi war? Uh, today, Saudi Arabia is suffering from uh, baby boomers uh, losing job and uh, having a lot of time to think about anything. So um, uh, every time they have you know, demonstrators on the street and, sh and chanting uh, democracy and something like that. You know? so, um, this atmosphere is very good, uh, very well fitted for uh, fundamentals to come in. And um, uh, lots of our uh, um, quote unquote Islamic warriors is, is, is departing from Saudi Arabia to uh, uh, have a terrorist attack in, in, in Iraq. Um, this tendency will prevail in, the, in, in Saudi Arabia or not. This is um, a kind of uh, uh, independent variable in the future. And the um, second thing is Russia, our friend. The United States should see its energy security from the viewpoint of a triangular relationship with the Gulf on one hand and Latin America and Russia. And these three triangular relations um, have to be independent uh, in order to play with them. So uh, Russia-Saudi relation is a test case for the US version of divide and rule. So on one hand, there is a supply side divide and rule policy. And on the other hand, we have to have a kind of uh, Asian uh, uh, consumers divide and rule policy uh, with the participation of the United States. Um, this is a kind of uh, uh, policy we have to think about. So um, final point is more consideration of international politics and strategy should be necessary in the energy world in coming decades. Um, before I close the session, um, I'd like to point out uh, this morning John has said about um, our Asian premium issue and uh, talked about you know, how um, Japan is going to uh, tackle on that. And he said um, uh, Japan has been too much obsessed with the security issues. Um, that prevented uh, Japan from uh, uh, going away from Asian premium. I should say that our Japan premium, uh, Japan has been obsessed with security wrongly uh, so far. But from now on, 
uh, wrongly in the mean that, uh, in the sense that Japan uh, has been thinking about uh, energy security on its own. Japan is going to do. Japan is going to do what, and uh, as a country, but. Um, uh, from now on, uh, with the participation of China on the scene, we have to think about um, consumer, uh, uh, consumers get together as a group um, to tackle with the issue. So uh, um, really, this kind of uh, uh, supply and the consumer uh, dichotomy is uh, uh, simple, but um, uh, very good um, uh, image to uh, begin th rethinking about the issue. Thank you very much. is going to uh, complete Dr. Hashimoto's comments. Thank you, Ms. Jaffet. My name is Ayako Sugino from IEEJ. Um, <laughs> I thank for this great opportunity to speak here. And it's it's first time for me to make, have presentation in English in my life. So I'm so <laughs> nervous. <laughs> um, Dr. Hashimoto talked about the impact of energy supply from Russia to Asian market. Um, current situation in East Asia is competition for Russian energy between China and Japan. I'd like to address my view on the significance of, of energy projects for um, Russian Chinese and Russian Japanese diplomatic relations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Start with Russo Sino relations. Mm -hmm. For Russo Sino relations, energy projects are important for two reasons. Firstly, energy projects sim symbolize um, change in quality and deepening of their partnership. Russia and China have common concern. For example, U.S. hegemony and terrorism or separatism. Um, so, um, two countries declared a strategic partnership in 1994, but economic cooperation has not been developed except arms trade. This situation is changing recently. Since the eve of September 11th, two countries are back away from anti-American diplomacy because both countries need to improve relations with the United States to join global economy and pursue economic growth. Um, oil pipeline project is um, suitable to symbolize this change in their relations because oil pipeline project is a um, cooperation in non-military sector. Mm. Ah. Secondly, Russia and China still perceive each other as a threat. For Russia, by supplying energy for China, they can make China to depend on Russia and enhance Russian national security. But when we think of um, potential demand size in China, Russia is at a risk of dependence on Chinese market. And because of this, cooperation with Japan is attractive for Russia. Um, I don't use this presentation sheet. Um, turn to Russian-Japanese relations. There are some political hurdles. And for a long time, Japan tried to link um, economic assistance with um, normalization, but this approach 
has not succeeded. And personally, I think in the future, cooperation in energy field will not bring solution for political hazards. The point is, um, for Russia, Japan is um, a card to protect itself from demand um, depend on China. And now, I think now, Russia is carefully considering um, Russia or China, um, which will depend on the other more heavily. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, our next and uh, final presenter is uh, Joe Barnes, who is a senior research fellow at the Baker Institute, formerly uh, a member of the policy planning staff of the U.S. Department of State. And we've given him the uh, challenging topic of uh, describing for you the emerging neoconservative views in the United States. Let me just give Joe uh, this disclaimer that when you're an American, because I've, I've made presentations, when you're an American and you start describing the neoconservative movement views, uh, let us not mistake Joe's description of these views for the idea that Joe holds these views, but he will describe for you uh, what the political debate is now in the spectrum in the United States. Uh, thank you. I will, I will focus, however, on, uh, on energy matters. I won't go into some of the broader uh, issues related to the emergence of neoconservatives as a powerful element in U.S. foreign policy. I might note that uh, you have to be very careful. Uh, the reason that neoconservative ideas have gained such salience in American foreign policy, and the war in Iraq is, is almost certainly, by any analysis, the outcome of neoconservative thinking. The reason that it's gained such importance is because very, very powerful figures who are not uh, traditionally considered neoconservatives or were not members of the neoconservative intellectual movement have endorsed their views or assumed their positions. The most notable would be uh, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld and Vice President Cheney. So we have to be careful uh, distinguishing uh, between sort of the classic neoconservative intellectual, of which Paul Wolfowitz would be a prime example, and their uh, supporters who more generally fall into, I would call, conservative foreign policy establishment types. Um, now I'll talk about oil, uh, but I'll come back to the neoconservative view of oil. Um, I'd like to talk about the American, ad American attitudes toward oil, particularly in a broader geopolitical sense rather than, than uh, commercial or even economic, although need, needless to say they're all very closely related. <clears throat> I would say that, and everything I'm going to say is grossly oversimplified, uh, that's because I'm a grossly simple man, <laughs> but uh, uh, I think you could safely say that what we're seeing is, is a sort of a, a shift in policy, um, energy policy, and I mean the foreign component of energy policy away from a sort of a status quo that we've been having for a long time, two decades, two and a half decades, toward possible alternatives. The status quo, of course, at least in the external part of the policy, was the special relationship with Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Um, the reasons why we would be interested in cultivating close relations with Riyadh, I think, are obvious. I don't have to go into them. Everyone here knows the data on reserves and production, and most importantly of all, excess capacity. Not most importantly of all, but often overlooked is the reason that, that Saudi Arabia plays such a vital role. Now, the special relationship is in trouble. It's in real big trouble. Uh, now, concerns about the special relationship, our special relationship with Saudi Arabia, well predate September 11th. There's been lo long been criticism of the relationship, not surprisingly, particularly among neoconservatives. And if you don't believe this, I urge you to look up back, back issues of Commentary Magazine and, and uh, the National Interest. Uh, but after September 11th, the U.S.-Saudi relationship plunged into deep trouble. Now, that may not be reflected in formal statements, 
Uh, I have a reporter friend that refers to these as happy talk. So we will still, you'll still hear the routine happy talk about how the United States and Saudi Arabia maintain their close relationship. But it is a relationship in trouble, clearly. Uh, certainly in the public view, it's, it's a relationship in huge trouble. The reasons why the relationship are in trouble, or is in trouble, I think, are also clear. Osama bin Laden was a Saudi national. Fifteen of the 19 people on September 11th were Saudi nationals. Saudi Arabia is generally considered to be unhelpful in the war on terrorism, is generally believed to be a supporter of Islamic Jihad and other uh, terrorist groups, um, and all around a unreliable ally, at best, an unreliable ally of the United States. So if this sort of uh, centerpiece of our foreign policy in oil is going, where, will it, where is it going to? I think the, the most likely outcome, and the outcome I think that is probably held or is sort of implicitly supported by most people in the, in the administration, could be called something the status quo plus. Um, I think it's, it's, it's been emerging for a number of years, particularly since the uh, breakup of the Soviet Union. Uh, but I think it's gained uh, uh, salience and urgency after September 11th. And the idea is basically to start spreading bets, to move away from too exclusive and uh, uh, too close a relationship uh, with Saudi Arabia and sort of to, to, to look for other important partners to ensure a safe and, and stable supply of oil to world markets and therefore to, to the U.S. economy. Uh, there are all sorts of p potential major producers, but I think that most of the interest has focused on two, one of which is, of course, Russia. Uh, and we've heard a lot about that today, and it's all been interesting. I don't have to tell you why Russia is potentially interesting as an alternate partner uh, to, to Riyadh. Uh, the, once again, the facts are clear, the, the, the numbers are there. But I would like to point out uh, some of the constraints, one of which is Russia is no Saudi Arabia. It does have lower reserves. It has essentially no spare capacity. Uh, it's unlikely to, 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 to hold large amounts of spare capacity under its current way of organizing. And it's not yet a global marketer. Although much of the stuff we've discussed today is about how Russia may become a, a global supplier. Uh, despite strides, investment remains problematic, foreign investment in particular. And then, uh, I'll just throw this out, it's potentially vulnerable in a price war. Uh, the Saudis punished Venezuela in the late 1990s for being, being uh, unhelpful on price discipline. They could potentially do the same with the Russians. Mind you, it could be mutually disastrous. I mean, the Saudis also are, are vulnerable. Uh, I know a lot of people, in, I know a lot of Russians say, oh, we don't worry about that, but it's easy to say when the oil prices are what they are today. I'm not so sure that they would, everyone would be so sanguine in Moscow if the price of, price was, the price of oil was $12.50. So uh, uh, you could see, as we did in the very late 1990s, some Russian cooperation with OPEC in the face of a, uh, a uh, collapse, well, uh, price collapse. Uh, so those are some of the constraints in, in, in you know, adding Russia to the, to the special, to, uh, to the status quo. The other country, of course, that's been very in much in the news lately, I don't know if you've noticed, is Iraq. Uh, uh, you will recall, of course, Iraq is a country that has so much oil that according to uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense Paul Wolfowitz, it will be able to finance its entire reconstruction from its oil revenues, uh, which I, I guess they've never actually, I guess being in, in government means never having to say you're wrong. But uh, it remains one of the most extraordinary statements by a senior government official of the last several years. Um, the numbers were clear. The numbers were obvious. The numbers could have been done on the back of an envelope. But let us pass on. Uh, Iraq is obvious. It's got uh, huge reserves, relatively low costs. But now the problems are clear as well. It's uh, uh, the industry has been in decline for decades. It's been chronic underinvestment. There's some war damage. Um, and of course, there's security concerns. They're improving. Production is up. Uh, production was 3.5 million barrels a day before the first Gulf War. About two point peaked at about 2.6, I think, in January of this year, just before the most recent war. 
And today, the most recent thing I heard was about 1.2 million barrels a day is being produced in, uh, in, in, in Iraq. Vast potential, but there's big constraints. Security is one I mentioned, cost. It's going to be hard to find the money to do this sort of expansion to four to six million barrels a day that people are talking about by the end of the decade. And there's huge hurdles to foreign investment. You just can't snap your fingers and say, come on in. Uh, in addition to security, just think of what you need. You need sort of political stability, some sort of reorganization of the oil industry, some sort of idea of regional uh, revenue sharing within Iraq, which is going to be an incredibly touchy subject. Fiscal reform in, in order to ensure that the government has sufficient revenues if they're not going to be able to get, you know, if they're not going to, if they're going to privatize the industry. Business investment law, probably some debt rescheduling and disposition of outstanding contracts uh, or concessions. So we're a long way from, from uh, seeing Iraq emerge as a, as, a, as a huge player in world oil markets, although it's obviously going to become a more important one. So in other words, you know, there are constraints with Iraq, too. Uh, does this mean that there's nothing worthwhile about the policy of status quo plus? Obviously not. Diversity is a, value, is a virtue in itself. Increased supplies, all other things being equal, will tend to diminish prices. But uh, I just would like to point out that there are major constraints. There is, of course, an alternative. Now, it's not in policy of the US government, and it's mainly found in the more esoteric pages of neoconservative journals. However, the war with Iraq was mainly found in the eccentric pages of, of, of uh, obscure neoconservative journals. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm just pointing out that, that, that you know, these things happen. Uh, I do say, I do urge everybody, if you want to, to really subscribe to Commentary Magazine, please, um, if you want to know what's bubbling up on the neoconservative side. Uh, here's the general argument. The general argument is that oil is used to finance terrorism and anti-American policies around the world. And Saudi Arabia is, in point of fact, an enemy. Uh, American neoconservatives, particularly the ones that aren't in government, are quite, quite ready to say this already. Saudi Arabia is an enemy. I think this, when I came across an article in commentary, or it might have been national, just saying our enemies, the Saudis. Uh, the object is to reduce the revenues available to our enemies, including the Saudis, by breaking OPEC, if we can. Uh, and the way we break OPEC is by in, in encouraging dramatic increases in productions in Iraq and, and Russia and uh, in particular pushing for privatization, uh, which has virtue in its own right. I mean, I'm, I am for privatization, but there is also one reason people push for privatization, or at least neoconservatives push for privatization, is it makes it very difficult to, or more difficult, to cooperate with OPEC on uh, output. Um, now, there are all sorts of problems with this view. Uh, and I don't think it's, 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 it's very much on the agenda right now because <clears throat> I, I think that things will work out or things, or there's a possibility things will work out well in Iraq, but it's certainly going to take a lot longer than people anticipated. So I don't, I don't see us embarking now on a, a major program to break OPEC. I don't think that's the policy of the administration. But uh, it may pop up again, and it certainly is floating out there in neoconservative circles. And, uh, uh, there are some problems, as I mentioned, and some of the key ones are that, you know, plummeting prices not only hurt presumed enemies like Saudi Arabia and Iran, they also, excuse my language, really screw friends. Russia is one that could be badly damaged, but most interestingly of all, Iraq. Uh, a new and fragile, dem you know, democratic Iraq could really be damaged by plunging oil prices. So, you, you know, we, 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 you, the problem is it's, it, is, it, is it's blunt instrument. And you really can't hurt the Saudis unless you hurt all producers. This is oversimplifying. But uh, it would really, really hurt uh, the Saudis. And uh, it basically, <clears throat> at least in the case of Russia, and to a certain extent an independent Iraq years down the line, it sort of makes the assumption, which is frequent, by the way, in American foreign policy, but do forgiveness, I for beg your forgiveness, that somehow other people will forego their own national interest because it's good for us. Now, I don't think that's going to happen, but it is an abiding feature of, uh, of American foreign policy, and uh, at least the approach. 
and uh, and it's certainly a, a uh, certainly going to be it's certainly not going to work in this instance. Now, it's funny. One thing is, as you'll notice, one thing is entirely missing from all of this discussion, which is anything having to do with what we would do in the United States ourselves. Uh, you know, it's as though there's no part of, uh, there's, no, there's no domestic production or there's no consumption in the United States. It seems like we tend to focus a lot on out there. And the reason is simple, which is uh, there's little sign that the United States is ready to do anything serious on the energy front domestically. I don't think any of us here would have trouble coming, to, coming and sitting down and saying, here's a grand compromise, right? We're going to... We're going to drill in Alaska, and we're going to open up some coastal areas, right? But guess what? We're going to bring SUVs under the like regular, you know, regular vehicles, and we're going to tighten up here on 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 this side. And we may introduce some very mo start start introducing modest level of taxation. That list the lady discussed this morning. I think a lot of reasonable people, even people in industry, right, could come if if you close the doors and let no reporters in, would say that's what the country has to do. As, as a component of its energy policy. But I see no evidence <laughs> that it's going to happen. What I hear about the current energy pill, bill is it's essentially a grab bag of subsidies for pet industries by, for congressmen, ethanol again. Um, they're going to build, it's a subsidy for the gas pipeline from Alaska because we don't, somehow or other, we don't want to let the, jet, the free markets work when it comes to, to, uh, to China. So my bottom line is, um, whether we're talking about the status quo plus, which is, I think, sort of where we're going, or the neoconservative alternative, the interesting feature of American energy policy is we're consist consistently ex attempting to externalize what are, in, in many ways, domestic problems. We find ourselves in the position of scolding Russians and chiding Saudis when we can't even come up with a plausible domestic energy policy. In a strange way, the fact that we have such an aggressive energy policy abroad reflects the fact that we are so weak domestically on this issue. Anyway, there's my presentation. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we have time. Uh, to start with the uh, discussion, I don't know if any, but let's start with questions on geopolitical issues or comments. Peter? Joe, I don't think that it has much to do with it, but you didn't have any remarks about Iran and the noise that had been made about Iran. Does it have anything to do with energy at all? Or no. What? Iran. Comments about Iran. Neoconservative. <laughs> no. No, I, I, do, I do know that uh, I think that neoconservatives would be very disappointed with this current agreement that's been struck because uh, I, I actually met a couple neo neoconservatives who deal with Iran and they're obviously, although they might be hesitant now, they're very, very keen on a preemptive strike, either by Israel or by the United States. Uh, they're really worried about firing up these reactors. Well, that would have implications for the oil markets too, then, right? Yes, it would. But it wouldn't be to lower the price of oil. Uh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> that is unfortunately, you know, one of the key inconsistencies in the neoconservative strategy on Iraq, right? Because there is this, uh, uh, to take it a step farther than what Joe said, there's this idea we privatized the oil industry in Iraq and therefore uh, that forces or pushes the pressure for privatization elsewhere in the Gulf. Uh, private oil companies operate for their own profit, they employ people, uh, and then they pay taxes to the government, and the government takes that money and you know, builds schools and roads, and uh, they don't have extra, and the government doesn't have billions of dollars coming in at a time that's not allocated to anything, and so therefore they can't dedicate it to nuclear weapons, right? That's sort of like, the, the thesis, right, is that we have, uh, and that's where you get this new interest in like stabilization funds, right? We're going to, you know, like Alaska, everybody's going to get $1,500 at the end of the year, you know, from the oil revenue. Um, the problem is uh, that people have taken, you know, some sort of what I call the kernel of truth. So 
You know, I used to joke that some of the things we've written in the Institute formed the kernel of truth for the neoconservative movement because we talked about how there was competition in OPEC in the 80s, and that provided a certain amount of market stability because if one producer got knocked out by accident or by war, there was OPEC had a lot of spare capacity, and so therefore they could just, somebody else could raise production. And that uh, you know, the new phenomenon we saw towards the end of the 90s was that spare capacity was sort of held back. We argued, of course, by sanctions policy, which they kind of ignored that that was the cause. And that, um, and that therefore, uh, the market had no resilience if anything went wrong, right? So what's interesting about this sort of proactiveness, like in other words, uh, the United States has to go out and act as an actor. In other words, we're not going to be a political taker. We're going to be a political actor. We're going to see politics we don't like. We're going to be proactive and change them. Is that, uh, there, you know, you could make an argument that, okay, we're going to have a new Iraq, we're going to have this democratic government, uh, and that they're going to privatize all state industry, and therefore uh, it's going to be a government that responds to tax-paying citizens, and therefore tax-paying citizens aren't going to agree to spend $10 billion on nuclear weapons when, you know, people don't have jobs and can't eat, right? The problem with that is, and, and the idea was that would diversify us from Saudi Arabia, take us away from this place where all our eggs are in one basket. The problem with that thesis, even if, it, you know, we could get to that idealized world and it actually functioned that way, which, you know, is somewhat questionable anyway, is that the time it takes you know, what happens in that interim yes. time, yeah. right? So in this interim time where now there's no government in Iraq uh, and exports from Iraq have fallen, uh, not only do we have all our eggs in one basket, but it's a more important, desperately important basket. So the irony is that by taking this action in Iraq, we've actually become much more dependent on the oil from Saudi Arabia. And I might also note that the idea somehow that democratic government or democratic polities are not going to support a nuclear program is repudiated by fact, right? India, the nuclear program in India was phenomenally popular. And I spoke to some Iranian experts that say, you know, even the reformers in Iran might want to have a nuclear program, right? <clears throat> so I'm just pointing out, you know, it's not, it's not intuitively obvious that if you have a democratic polity, they're not going to want to have a, 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 a nuclear missile. And I take it a step further. It's not a given that if you could deprive a country of its oil revenues, it would still build a bomb. they wouldn't still build a bomb. And I think North <laughs> Korea is a great case in point. <laughs> you know, they starve right. the people to build a bomb. Right, they right. The bomb more. Yeah. So, um, a point about the U.S. energy, um, the new U.S. energy um, strategy, or when Cheney first yeah. introduced the, the new pl uh, plan, it was to diversify away from well, to, to reduce our dependence, U.S. dependence on, on foreign oil, move away from the Gulf, focus on, if I remember, it was Russia mm -hmm. and our Latin American friends. Mm -hmm. Now, our Latin American friends were, and I think this was, well, this was pre, or no, it wasn't no, pre. Was it was Chavez. Chavez. So Chavez, Chavez. Chavez was ruled out, and there was Mexico. Mm -hmm. And Mexico has, you know, we've, we've seen the problems with, Trying to develop, you know, stronger, you know, rapport relationship with Mexico, Russia. I think with all, um, all of the positive things that we've heard over the last year, we're nowhere closer now to, to seeing any strong, you know, benefit from um, you know, Russian development of oil, you know, coming this way. So I, we're really, you know, I think Joe is right that that is, you know, we're trying to find. The foreign aspect of this and ignoring the domestic. Well, I wouldn't. I'm not dismissing it entirely. See, because Russia has to, has significantly increased output, mm -hmm. and that's a good thing. Yes, because I mean, I yeah, mean that, I, we should not forget that. Right. I wouldn't. I'll let I, you finish with that, and then I'll. Yeah, this for sure. I wouldn't take away from the fact that more oil yeah. coming out of, of anywhere benefits, mm -hmm. you know, globally, mm -hmm. because of, you know we talk. <clears throat> I mean, it's obvious. Mm -hmm. um, but for U.S. and my feeling is for U.S. you know. For U.S. policy, where else can we turn? It's we're, a pretty small list. But we're still in the same boat that we were, and if we take, if we're starting to diversify away from Saudi Arabia, you know, how much can we do that realistically? 
Um, it, it, the, um, I'm sorry, I don't have a copy here, I quote verbatim. But it's not just, it's, it's not, I think it's a gross oversimplification, to borrow Joe's phrase, to say the policy said uh, we're getting out of the Gulf and we're, you know, we're going we're gonna to rely on Russia and Mexico. I mean, it did talk about diversifying suppliers in the global energy, Russia, Caspian, I mean, they're not, obviously, they they're not in Russia, but Africa, But that policy Latin is America. not a new thing, right? Huh? Well, that, that policy is not a new thing, no conservative uh, thing. No, it's um, not a new conservative thing. I'm just That's a standard about diversity that. of supply argument. It's, okay. it's a standard right. diversity of supply argument. I, I don't think the Vice President of the Commission on Energy thought, well, in a year we're going to see, <laughs> we're going to be importing oil from so many other places that we're not going to be dependent on OPEC. It was, here's one of the ways in which we inc try to increase U.S. energy security is to, uh, to do things to support increased sources of supply in the global market. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that said, let me just respond. No, not, not meaning to identify myself as a neoconservative in any way. <laughs> but of course the U.S. government is aware that, that, that um, Russia is not a swing producer. I mean, it doesn't, even if things get a whole lot better, and even if more of that production goes into the export, the numbers are there. It's clear. You know, I, mean, I, it's I not agree with you, but you know what? The numbers were there saying that Iraq couldn't finance reconstruction either. Yeah, I know that, yeah. And I don't think <coughs> I think the bill for reconstruction came in bigger than the people who planned. <laughs> I agree. No, no, I, agree I, agree with you. I agree with you. I agree with you. I agree with you. People completely. Well, I'll tell you an interesting thing on the uh, mm -hmm. on the Russian question that just came out at another conference I was at earlier this week is one of the things that was proposed by the Rush, some of the Russian speakers at the first summit that was really not sort of taken up, right? was the idea if the Russians were going to, in any way or form, play a swing producer role in times of emergency, that they would have to do it not in the same way Saudi Arabia does it, they'd have to do it by storing oil and having a Russian SPR that would be in Russia and that they proposed would be used to, to sell oil to countries that didn't have a strategic reserve. Right? And the U.S. government really dropped the ball on that in the sense that it wasn't pursued. So I was saying this uh, at this conference that was mostly Asian analysts. And I was very surprised because it seems like something the U.S. could kind of go back to now. Now that we've, you know, stopped being so obsessed with PSA, we could focus on something else. And, you know, getting Russia into a stockpiling system maybe that involved uh, cooperation in, in ASEAN, right? Um, could be something that could be pursued. And of course, as Sakhalin production comes on, maybe one of the stockpiles could be located in the Russian Far East, right? And the interesting thing about that that shocked me, and I'd be interested in people's reaction, is that these other participants at the security conference in Hawaii, all the Asian countries, Pakistan, the Indians, absolutely said that they refused to rely on Russia during a time of an emergency and that the Russians would, why would the Russians sell them the supply? And I was really very surprised to hear that ASEAN countries were not willing to have Russia be a swing producer for them. So I don't know if anybody has a reaction to that. I mean, when you talk about a swing producer, I mean, I think one of the things that we should have learned over the last 15 years, how delicate that that OPEC power, power balance is that it doesn't take much additional oil on the markets to start pushing the prices down. It starts pushing the revenue of these countries down. They start cheating a little bit because they need the additional revenue. That puts more oil on the market. I mean, we've seen two massive downswings in oil prices followed by two massive upswings. I don't think that Russia has to be the swing, a swing producer in the conventional sense like, uh, like Saudi is having you know, three or four million barrels of extra capacity to actually have a significant impact on the world oil markets. But you're always talking about adding. How, the, the key thing from a Russian point of view might, at some point might be subtracting. It could be. Right, and how that's, that, that, res, that reserve's not gonna help them subtract. The only thing that can no. help them subtract is like having Transnet under government control. Right. Right? And saying no. Right, right. I mean, if Russia were to put an additional Three million barrels, two to three million barrels a day of capacity on the markets. That would put a huge squeeze on the OPEC 
producing countries, and I think you'd see an absolute right. We're actually we're saying that the collapse is all the Russians. Well, obviously they're going to they, if they're if they're rational, they'll be price they'll be they'll be revenue maximizers. They'll cut a deal with Riyadh. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ivanov. Mm -hmm. I just want to make a question with regard to Russia and attitude. I think it takes a crisis to change the attitude. Mm -hmm. And you remember the conference we attended together in Carlisle mm -hmm. three years ago? Mm -hmm. And you were speaking in favor of treating Russian energy interests in Europe in the context of the NATO expansion in a more decent, more comprehensive way. And there was very, very uh, little response from the audience. Yeah, wasn't that incredible? And now it's like conventional wisdom. That's right. true. And yeah. Remember that uh, uh, high-level intelligence uh, agency official, when I was asking him a question, what really Russia could serve in positive terms for the United States or the allies of the United States, he never even mentioned the energy. This changed. And I think that uh, ASEAN may require a crisis before they change the attitude. But could, could Russia reali I mean, Russia realistically couldn't store enough? Well, there's not going to be enough money that would come in in Russia capacity to store enough to really make a difference in any kind of a long term. I mean, if you're talking about an SPR like the U.S., that really the function of any release is almost it's just signal to the market as opposed to a real right. placement of supply for a long time. And I don't think it's realistic to think that Russia could have an SPR that would that would serve the, the ASEAN community, the community of importers that's so large. Well, I mean, just, it, the numbers aren't It's costly. Aren't there. Yeah, it's costly. Right. I mean, I think that, that idea was floated as kind of, why don't you pay us to keep the oil here? And just, you know, but it, it, it's really, it seemed to me like kind of a simplistic revenue-seeking thing. It didn't seem to me that it, it was realistic in terms of some kind of import that it could have. Well, the, the, the question is if, um, there are times of year in Russia where they can't export all their oil for weather reasons, mm -hmm. right? So they do have an opportunity, right, probably to even at their own expense. I mean, say it was just the cost of the tank. You know, the United States loan them the cost of the tank or Japan loans them the cost of the tank. There are times of year where there's production that just stays on the ground because of export barriers. So probably building it up over time probably wouldn't be as costly as it sounds. Did, right. Didn't uh, wasn't there a discussion of this at one point about different places in Asia that facilities that were the oil could be held, the oil could yeah. be held, and, yeah. then, and then the, those companies would pay yeah. rent. I, it, well, 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 I mean, you know, there's salt domes in Asia. There was some discussion about yeah. using the salt domes in Asia. I mean, one of the points that was made at this conference was that if ASEAN countries were going to get together and pay for storage. Yeah. You know, why not just pay for storage in some other neutral location like Singapore? But you right. want the storage in consuming countries rather than <coughs> producing countries, which might have right. an opportunity to exploit the market. Right. Well, that was the... But even in consumer countries, I, the, the U.S. hasn't used the strategic petroleum reserve in ways that would balance the market, have they? No. So why would the Russians would have a vested interest in exploiting a tight market? Why would they want to? Well, the idea was that you would bring them into a full multinational system. In other words, you're going to have the IEA system, you're going to expand it to include ASEAN countries, and then you're also going to include Russia as a player. But the, so it's really but more the of IEA an integrated... The IEA was, 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 was a club of the consumers. Right. And, and, and Russia's interests are presumably to cooperate, I would think, cooperate with OPEC. Well, this was a way of trying to get them on a different page. Since they were well, no, I mean, look, it, 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 uh, Ron, it would still be in Russia's interest to, to cooperate with consumers in those circumstances where the price rise leads to sufficient economic dislocation to cause a long-term loss of market. Loss of market. <laughs> I admit it's not the entire universe of issues, but it's it's a non-trivial issue where the Russians might find it in their interest. You know, but but the cost of storing a lot of oil <clears throat> for that once in a decade event it could be very very high. 
Yeah, yeah, salvage is because they store it in the ground, right? So uh, they just don't produce. That means, <laughs> exactly right. Which is a lot cheaper than pumping it up and having to. I mean, I would think it would be cheaper for Russia to do the same thing as just basically build the additional export capacity. Well, I mean, yeah, it means a lot more to the consumer side uh, than to the Russian side, probably not. But uh, um, if we take Asian market as a whole, um, China is going to take part in, in Asian market, huge um, uh, consumption power. And we don't have any uh, storage, uh, except for Japan and some other countries, very small. So uh, it is meaningful uh, to have a kind of uh, uh, concept that we are uh, the same market sharing, the same software. Well, I understand why why Korea, Japan, and China might have storage. That I understand. Yeah. I guess yeah, I was placing the storage um, based in uh, Sakhalin is uh, not a bad idea mm. in this sense. But if you have storage in a third country, it controls that storage. It's a producer. I, I agree. I mean, it seems a little counterintuitive to me that you're really going to think you can count on that price. That's yeah. another point. Yeah. 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 You can get it in any circumstances. Yeah. Martha, you have a question? Otherwise, I guess we just need for strategic petroleum reserve in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> be a lot cheaper. Yeah. That's been our policy for two years. That's been the uh, for two decades. The Saudis have been our no, strategic. No, we don't no, use I, ours because we're using that. It's important to have it from the north of Morocco. It's a question for Joe. Um, in your presentation, which I largely agreed with, um, spending lots of time around the old conservatives. That, but not in any way. She won't presume like the president. All my best friends are here. Because, uh, <laughs> uh, people I went to the University of Chicago with. The, you know, you know, oh boy, yeah. Okay, so, yeah. You know, it's like it's a world I do. Bloom know. land up there. Yeah, it's a, it was pre-bloom when I went there. Um, but not pre any of these people. Yeah. But it, First, in, in painting a picture of the world, you kind of left out their picture of the world. You kind of left out the role of Israel, too, and the focus on Israel as savior, which is part of some of these people's models. I agree. Um, you know, and I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm very careful about that when I make presentations to groups, because it's... It's a it's a delicate subject. I understand, it, but it's part of their model. I know, I know. I and agree with you. I mean, it's like, and if you, if Richard Pearl includes it in his presentation, and we include exclude it in summarizing his presentation, that's true. Then, in a sense, we're, we're not. Being, we're being cowardly. Well, <laughs> speak for yourself. No, I will. <laughs> no, I tend to be very careful because I, I, one has to be so careful. No, I, I, I understand. The accusation of anti-Semitism comes very me, quickly. It's easy for me to say it because I'm a practicing Jew than right. it is for you to say it. Because I'm very going. Because you're not. Yeah. Yes. Because <laughs> you're not. Um, so that, that's, and that, but if you include that factor in it, their model becomes even more scary. Yeah, I mean, one of the funny things is one of the first things that bubbles start bubbling out in Iraq is building is refurbishing the pipeline to Israel? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Remember this? You've seen the news? And some of the bankers that have gone back are Iraqi Jews who had some of the big bankers that now, have gone back or Iraqi you know, the situation is very delicate in Iraq. The thing the United States really needs to do is build a pipeline to Israel. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, I mean... Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think that's the scariest part, and that's where I was moving next. I mean, I, I think... <clears throat> I mean, you're talking about Saudi Arabia. I think that there, there are certain neoconservatives that would like to turn the Middle East, Middle East into a U.S. Israeli condominium. That's, that's you agree with of, me? Yeah, I do. That's what I want. I felt really belonged on yes. the table as part yes. of their model. If yes. they say it publicly, then we shouldn't. Doug shrink Fife from and quoting Doug Fife it. and Pearl made it very that's clear right. in that that's famous right. Defense of the Realm piece they wrote for Bibi Netanyahu, was it not? I think so. I mean, Pearl's made it clear to yes. in every setting I've seen him in in the last three yeah. years. So. And and the I only I want, and I'm also very hesitant to say that because I've lived in the Middle East, and you want to be very careful not to play into cons to conspiracy sometimes theory. rather ugly anti-Semitic conspiracy yeah. theories. You know, but you're right. There are some of these thinkers, particularly Pearl and Doug Fight, that come very. I mean, endorse the concept of condominium, right? Which is 
you know, Israel will take care of this part, and we'll take care of this part, and... and it's not it's, clear if Wolfowitz opposes it. It's not clear that he... Wolfowitz He's not is, the author of it, to be sure. Yeah, Wolfowitz is very complicated on this issue. For instance, Wolfowitz is significant, it may not be significant in the big terms because of where his position is to begin with, but let's put it this way. On, the, on Arab-Israeli dispute, for instance, Wolfowitz is significantly to the left of a lot of other neocons, right? He is no great fan of Ariel Sharon's. No, he isn't, but he has his own views about Turkey, which can also unsettle the, I mean, he... Well, that's another great idea. Oh, well, now that we have British col colonial troops here, reminders of the British colonial period in Iraq, and of course, American troops to remind them of what they consider to be the current colonial occupier, Let's bring in the Turks, the to, right. to, so we can remind, so we can further humiliate the, the Iraqis by reminding them they were under Turkish rule for five hundred. Yes, that's, <laughs> yes, that's another really clever. But that's much more consistent with But that gets me to my question for you, which is, I take it you feel that there were some strategic miscalculations involved in decision making about Iraq. Um, okay. Do you think the same group of people are capable of miscalculating these other countries? I mean, do you think we're, we are heading to a place where right, we should be talking about what roles Russia could play, you know, maximum scenarios, because we will have created, if you're looking three, four years down the line, problems that are going to fester for 10? I think there's going to be a lot of festering. Uh, but I think that if you talk about in terms of direct U.S. action, right? Or indirect U.S. Well, action indirect that creates... More, in direct, in direct U.S. action, I mean, we are pretty well tied up in Iraq right now. And we're going to be tied up for a long time to come. So I, I think that the freedom of action of the administration has been reduced significantly, frankly. What are you thinking of in terms of Central Asia, let's say? No, I was thinking about, I was thinking about the Middle East. I wasn't thinking about Central Asia. I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, I can't. What does the word peace process mean anymore? I mean, well, I think we're moving. Well, what if Israel goes to all out war against. Well, you just saw, did you see the New York Times today? Did you see the latest I haven't, map? I haven't looked. Did you see the latest map? Did you see where they're, they're going to put the wall? They're going to put it, a part of the wall in the Jordan Valley. <laughs> That's what I mean by so that, so that So that, so that uh, for all intents and purposes, that the, the Palestinian state will be cut off from Jordan? I don't know. I mean, the, the thing that I'll tell you is I'm an old-fashioned old foreign policy conservative, moderate conservative, right? I'm, so much stuff has happened that so upset, so, has so upset my assumptions about the way the world runs and the way the United States acts that I can, I'm... I'm frankly at sea in making any predictions about future behavior. Right, and, and I think that, I mean, the fundamental point, and, and Joe and I were working on an article and he had this language that really, I think, summed it up, which is that the United States is sitting in a country in the Middle East not at the invitation to its government, by its government. And that is so groundbreaking. I mean, we... And, and there was no, I mean, I guess we were at war with Iraq in the sense that we had the no-fly yeah. zone and everything. But it's such a radical change. I mean, the thing that I always point out to groups when we talk about, like, debate in the United States um, and what was considered a fringe idea and what has become a mainstream mm -hmm. idea, um, and everybody's the promise they won't tell them I said this, there's a very respected analyst in the Washington elite named Michael Mandelbaum. I think he may be one of the most respected authors in the American you know, political science community, international relations community. Clinton almost picked him to be uh, head of the policy plan. So. Right, so he's a very, you know, it, it, and, and to give you a, just a, a smattering of it, if Michael Mandelbaum was doing a book volume on international security and he asked you to write a chapter, you would be very flattered that he asked you to write a chapter. So I'm sitting in my office one day, and somebody faxes me an op-ed he wrote for New York Newsday. And he was advocating that it's too dangerous to let Saudi Arabia control the eastern province. And so it should become a UN mandate. And the UN military should sit on those reserves and produce them for the benefit of poor countries of the world. 
I mean, this is a mainstream thinker. As, as though UN occupation of the Eastern Province would mean anything other than the U.S. invasion and occupation of the Eastern Third of Saudi Arabia. Right. I mean, that's, that's what he is endorsing. I mean, you, know, you can understand the Saudi paranoia now. Right. I'm not, I'm not defending Saudi Arabia at all. No. But, I mean, you, you can only imagine when they're hearing this neoconservative rhetoric coming from Pearl or from, you know, watered down from Wolfowitz or whatever about, you know, the, this goal of uh, the idea that, that um, we would, you know, the Middle East would be, you know, would turn into a democratic, you know, um, liberal, 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 liberal world. Yeah, right. We have a liberal paradise, um, right? That, that would be a true friend of the U.S. Right. Like Israel. Right. And then, you know, you have all of this backlash against, you know, Riyadh right now. You know, that's not going away. Right. And then, and then they have this, you know, this rhetoric that's coming out in different ways. <clears throat> and I can't imagine how the current administration is able to convince or, you know, assuage, you know, the Saudis that, that this isn't, you know, this well, isn't truly reflective of... of you know what well, to me? If I was a Saudi, do you know what I'd do? What's that? I'd get a nuclear weapon. They did. They just had weapons Actually, transferred that, that's, from Pakistan. That's largely been discredited. That's oh, is it? That story yeah. is discredited? But I'm just saying, I mean, that's the sort of, once you start down this path, countries say, what, how can I protect myself? And given the incredible United States military advantage, the only way a country can even hope to protect itself nowadays is to develop and deploy a nuclear weapon. Yeah. Although the story was interesting, I think it's been discredited. Has it? Okay. Large from the Washington Times, which is owned by the, <laughs> the Reverend Moon. The Reverend Moon. Right, right, right. But people actually, you know what people were saying? People were saying that it was. It was a leak uh, from, uh, uh, it was the Israeli government through some neocons into the Washington Times. I, I will tell you. Is that plausible? I think that's a plausible. No, thing. actually, actually, I saw the report, uh -huh. and actually it started out with a U.S. naval or some kind of U.S. military paper that was presented at a closed conference mm -hmm. oh. that cited it. Okay. Right? So, I mean, it wasn't just, you know, somebody made it up. I mean, it was in somebody's paper that was presenting within the U.S. military. I, I saw, don't that doesn't make it true. No, I saw a paper from somebody inside the U.S., maybe it was the same paper, right? in which he speculated that this might happen. Well, that might be it, and then but it got misreported. But he didn't say there had been any agreement. I right. Sorry. Anyway, uh, Dr. Hashimoto, did you have... Uh, well, I mean... You know, neoconservative, uh, forget about it, but um, our United States policy our, on the Middle East is, um, has, um, has, a, has a continuation of uh, dual, dual containment of uh, Iran and Iraq. And um, uh, in the Middle East situation, um, Iran and Iraq um, has never been uh, a part of it. But uh, suddenly, uh, Iraq came into the equation and we don't know what to do. And uh, my question is, um, how do you are, are see are the development in Iraq? Um, uh, if you put into the uh, uh, rough water theory, uh, uh, you know, if our, uh, Iraq is going to recover quickly, um, that will reduce um, development speed in no other country like Russia. And uh, if uh, uh, Iraq uh, recovery is slow, um, there will be a <coughs> uh, rapid development in the production of oil and gas in, in Russia, whichever you prefer. That is my first question. The second question is, uh, from the point of view of our uh, neoconservative, um, how do you appreciate our pipeline uh, from via Murmansk, uh, Nautuka, and uh, Daki? Well, my preference would be, in every instance, for a pipeline for movement of oil uh -huh. that would make it vulnerable to U.S. naval interdiction. Yeah. So therefore, I would support Mermans. Hmm. To the first question. I'll leave you on that one. Uh, what I would say... Oh, well, I don't think that's what it was. Right. <laughs> right. I'm trying to think, I'm trying to like get in the head of a neoconservative. <laughs> right? Careful. Um, 
Yeah, it's hard to do. I mean, I, I guess <laughs> it's science. Just be careful so you can get that right. out. It's <laughs> um, a complicated situation. Yeah, it's a complicated question. I mean, it really depends on, um, if you're really a neoconservative, then I guess you believe that you are going to control the Middle East and Iraq is going to be this friendly country. So maybe I don't believe that that's necessarily implementable, but they do, right? So if you believe that, they believe that, then I would say the preference would be for the oil to come out of Iraq instead of Russia. Because they, they probably still don't quite the, trust the Russians in the same way, right? And in terms of the pipeline routes, I agree with Joe, but I'd take it a step further because the only reason the neoconservatives are not focused on China is because they get bigger fish to fry post September 11. Well, yeah, they don't had like some, China either. Right, had September 11 not happened, unfortunately the whole focus of everything they were thinking would have been China. And indeed, there is this school on the Chinese question that says China is this large emerging economy. Uh, resources are going to be scarce, which you know is kind of debatable whether that's true or not, but they come to this mindset, resources are going to be scarce, and by resources, it's not just oil, could be food, right, and water. Resources are going to be scarce, and how are we, the United States, going to protect ourselves and our allies from China using all these resources that the rest of us need? So this is sort of a, a neoconservative mindset that somehow uh, economic growth in China is not a good thing, right? Um, because it's going to, you know, challenge the world's needs and supplies of resources. So I would say from that point of view, even though it's not a priority order concern, right, if you take their thinking down to its logical conclusion, and I, I just add a point on the whole question of the Arab-Israeli conflict, where the Saudis come to be, as Richard Pearl called them, the, was it he or oh, his consultant called them the Colonel of the Colonel, yes. right? Where that really comes from is, uh, I don't even think it's really from the whole Al-Qaeda thing. There is this belief that comes into the whole Israel question that when you look at Islamic Jihad and when you look at Hamas and these groups that prevent the peace process, and the Saudis don't deny it, right? That these groups that make the peace process impossible to implement are funded by Saudi Arabia and supported by Saudi Arabia. So from a neoconservative point of view, Saudi Arabia came forward with a peace plan, but that's crap from a neoconservative point of view because they're funding the very groups that are destroying the possibility of a peace process, right? And so in the neoconservative world, Every country in the Middle East is a democracy. People don't want to be blown up, so they vote for liberalization. I mean, I don't think that's the real world, but that's the world they believe in. So everybody with this liberalized democracy where everybody can have a good job and pursue their pursuit of happiness, and so therefore we can have a peace process. We make peace with Israel. We have a pipeline that can go from Iraq to Haifa, yeah. right, because we're going to have economic development all through the Middle East that wasn't able to happen because of authoritarian regimes and corruption, right? So that might be, you know, a very pretty picture, and it might not be realistic, but that's part of the whole view. And so Saudi support for local Palestinian movements is seen as disruptive to that view. And they also, I think neoconservatives uh, believe that Saudi Arabia is exporting, more generally exporting fundamentalist Islam right. through that's the financing right. of madrasas. And they are, though. They are. No. I mean, that's, that's part of the problem is that, you know, some of what they argue is correct. It's correct, absolutely. And, but the conclusions that they draw from it don't have, as Amy says, don't right. necessarily, they create an, they take facts that, that may be correct and they create this idealized version of the world out of it. You know, right. the world is not, the University of Chicago is not a microcosm of what the world could become if everybody got well, I mean, the I'm chance make, to go through this. You know, I want to make a very general comment here and I've read a good deal of I've, over the years. In fact, I was, remember I alerted you to the whole neocon right. before the, I mean, right. I've always been interested in it. I've even attempted to read Leo Strauss, for which I deserve. I studied with those people. <laughs> okay. Tough read. I did that from mine. But, I the, that's not so tough. The, but the thing about, I, I find, and I find this probably most in, in, in the, uh, not in the leaders of the neocon movement, the fathers, not the Leo Strausses or Blooms, but 
in the ideologues that run it now. It's all, generation. They remind me of Marxists. Mm -hmm. They remind me of, you know, a Marxist would, you know, if, if economy went, if the, if, the, if the capitalist system was doing fantastically well, the Marxist would say, but the crisis is coming, right? In other words, every, or, if the, if, if, or if, the, if the capitalist system was going down, they say, the crisis is coming. In other words, you just take whatever fact exists and you shove it into an ideological framework and you get the answer you want. In a strange way, they remind me of doctrinaire Marxists. They're doctrinaire, they're ideologues. You know, it's this, right. I, it's just I, I think, I think that neoconservatism is the Leninism of the right. I really do. And, and I think that Not that's, as dangerous, right. you know, as but, but it's got the same sort of... But that's you know, what happened on Iraq. See, on Iraq, the whole concept that the oil revenue was gonna pay for everything was part and parcel to the argument that this was a costless policy, right. right? And so the fact that, as Joe said, you could sit there and say, well, okay, the oil revenues of RAC have never been over $25 billion. Of which, how much goes for food? No, 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 well, no now they've been like $10 billion, of which $7 billion went to food, right? So that left you $3 billion, of which you would actually need to spend all of that just to fix the oil fields. Right. So therefore, Excluding you Excluding know, any debt service. Right, yes. right, right. So I mean, you're gonna have nothing to work with, right? Um, I mean, you just look at the numbers in, in two seconds and you know that the numbers can't add, right? And, um, and that it would cost $50 billion to get the six. Because at six, you could have $40 billion in revenue at 20. But you know, it's not, it doesn't even work, because if you had six to get the 40 or $50 billion of revenue that Wolfowitz referred to, the price of oil had to be $21. Yeah. But if they were at six, the price of oil is not going to be $21, it's going to be 12. Right, so there's like no way to make those numbers. And yet they say it, they said it in public. Public officials of the United States government stood up and used that argument. Right, and I think that they, I think, I, my honest opinion is. They believed they, it. They believed it, right, because they so, it's what Joe's saying, I so want to jam a square peg into this round hole that I found somebody who said that we could get the six, the market would stay at 20, you know, Matt Simmons came in and said we're running out of oil, we're going to need that six. Right? And they said, see, that's it. They get Colin Campbell and Matt to come and say, well, we've completely run out of oil. We need that six. Right? And that's it. And, and not that we need that six at, at 2025, but we're going to need that six, you know. In a, I mean, Colin Campbell published an article in the National Interest, which is a neoconservative journal, saying that oil would peak in 2003. Right? Yeah, but he wrote an article in 1981 saying it'd peak in 83. <laughs> and an article in 92 saying it'd peak in 95. Right, but my point to you is that, so you say, you're, so people who are somewhat knowledgeable, I mean, I have this say. problem because the New York Times calls me and said, well, he must be lying. And it's hard to say, you don't understand, there are people out there that are writing that there's no oil. So it fits. You know so what I mean? It, it fits. It, it makes your argument stronger. So accept it, right? And use it. Right. But there are people who understood it wasn't true. There were. Right. I assume the man who spoke it must have known. He is one smart man. But there are a lot of people, and I mean, not to He's you know, man. again, because we have people who are not from the United States. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of people who are. Po I mean, if Saudi Arabia came to me and asked me about Richard Pearl. What I would say is Richard Pearl is visible, but not important, in the sense that he really can't implement a policy that's not realistic, right? Well, because we didn't cut off. We, we put sanctions on Saudi Arabia. But we've done the first steps. I mean, you know, like he has this complicated game, you know, of the world, and the first steps in it are in act or in motion and he yeah but he only could get that step implemented because of the paranoia about September 11 about September 11 Absolutely. and weapons of mass scary, destruction in Iraq isn't that scary enough though that that someone that someone who is vocal who's representing a particular agenda right is able to get that through. I mean, yeah, but I mean, a lot of circumstances had that happen. It's more than just there. other people understood that it it was it suited other people's interests yes. too. It's That's not, what I'm saying. It's not him alone. It's That's not what him I'm saying. Alone. But it's unfortunate that there is someone that, who is that visible. Who See, I'm much more concerned about Michael Mandelbaum saying it than anything well, Richard Pearl would say. Yeah. But no. That's the, we've had the center move, right? That's what I just said. That's, yeah. a, that's exactly no, what I, I said. It just showed where the center has moved to. Yeah. 
But he was convenient for people. I mean, one shouldn't exaggerate Pearl's own importance. If he were But that's the name that's people. the name that the Saudis see. Yeah. But that's not accidental. Maybe well, that's the name the Saudis see and and, and that is a shock value for them. I mean, yeah, well, I mean, there's a reason that people like Scooter Libby keep off the public exactly. radar. He's a mighty important man, exactly. let me tell you. Exactly. He's probably a lot, in terms of affecting policy, a damn sight more important than Richard Pearl. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Steve? Yeah, no. Maybe not to take us too far in another direction, but since we don't have a lot of time, I, I kind of a question about that I think is useful to draw upon a lot of the people in the room. And that is, it seems like one of the conclusions everybody's kind of drawn together is that. The United States, Japan, China, the, the, they don't have too many tools to bring to bear on Russia to make a decision anytime soon. On the pipeline. On the pipeline or right. a lot of issues. And yet, there's a, there's a whole issue of WTO. And I wonder, you know, how important is it for Russia to join WTO? Today, uh, you mean? Yeah, for them to join. Yeah, is it important for them to join? And then what's the position of the various governments? And also, you know, there's a particular problem here, too, in the sense that Maybe you might want to offer them favorable terms to join, uh, better than other people who have joined recently. But China, the Chinese government, has to approve Russia joining. And China joined under very, very strict conditions, uh, which the Chinese public really don't know about. <laughs> and, and so if the Chinese government agrees to let Russia into the club uh, on terms much better than when they joined, then they face a very strong political problem. But what's um, in it for uh, yeah. Russia, Steve? That's what I mean, I'm wondering. Uh, Russia exports raw materials. Those, everybody, wants, everybody wants to buy those. You don't have to worry about protection against raw materials. Yeah. But in fact, well, I would argue Russia they would not want to join WTO because they'd like to protect their own domestic industry, which mm -hmm. they'd find difficult if they joined WTO. That's my question. Is it worth anything for Russia? I, I, I mean, it's a personal opinion, but I don't think it's enough to give up any of the core issues. I mean, the EU is pushing very hard in the, the negotiations on domestic energy pricing. Mm -hmm. For them, that's a bottom line. Mm -hmm. And they're not really getting anywhere. And I don't know, I mean, my guess is the EU is going to cave on that sooner than Russia is. Okay. Um, Russia could say that for them. And, yeah, I, I mean, yeah. they want in, but they're not going to give up a whole lot. They don't need the foreign investment. I mean, they, I mean, they'd like some foreign investment, but getting some. Mm -hmm. And they have lots of resources from the oil exports. I, I don't see what's in it for them. So and they, they have the EU you. over a barrel because they need double the gas they're they now yeah. having, and it has to come from Russia. So I think the Russians actually hold quite a few cards, yeah. right? I mean, you have to think that Russia has, you know, some great manufacturing potential, but because of its past, it's, this is all very inefficient. And how are you going to get that this, this industry fueled, this development of industry fueled? It seems to, I, I don't know if I were them. I, so it sounds like these <laughs> energy relations really are then yeah. an obstacle to development of a <coughs> more, more complete, more mature Russian economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A couple of relevant points on that. Uh, towards the year 2010, the goal is to double the Russian GDP. Mm -hmm. In 20 years, to triple under the favorable circumstances. However, the uh, energy consumption is going to grow by 40%. We tend to think that uh, Russia, Japan, Russia, China energy cooperation, or Russia, US energy cooperation for that matter, is a kind of the one way street. Russia sells, Russia exports, Russia benefits. EU made it very clear that uh, the European Union will be ready to consider ways and means to transfer technology for the energy saving. Energy saving is going to be the most strategic challenge for the Russian industry and for the Russian enterprises and for the Russian consumers. In that respect, Japan is the world leader. So I would uh, strongly such as to incorporate energy links in Northeast Asia with the <coughs> technological transfer. Another, another matter is that uh, this morning the CNN uh, 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 informed us that the DPRK came up with some kind of positive response to the uh, President Bush proposal in regard to the security guarantees. Hmm. They thought for a couple of days, and then they said that they are ready to consider the proposal. And North Korea, of course, is a very, very sensitive and very difficult issue. But again, the heart of the issue, as, as far as the civilian <laughs> section is concerned, the heart of the issue is energy. Right. And over the last uh, two and a half years, 
North Korean delegation at least five times visited Khabarovsk. They were seriously discussing the prospects for building uh, uh, transmission line, electricity transmission line. So whatever will be the solution, it's unlikely that KEDA will be revived. If it is not KEDA, we have to look for some conventional options. Oil, yes, maybe electricity first, will be among these options. And again, there is a common ground for all the countries involved in this part of the world, including Russia, to, to work together. <laughs>